tonight. It's Bellator Cage Girl and also model, uh, Jade Bryce. We'll talk with her about uh, working the Bellator Cage and some of the things that she does in her life. We'll get our Monday night kicked off right, <clears throat> to say the least. And as that phone rings, just want to mention that this interview is brought to you by CinoDiet.com. Go to CinoDiet.com and check it out. No, oh, come on, come on. Answer your phone. Answer your phone, Miss Jade Bryce. Well, doesn't look like she's going to answer on the first try. So, Hello? we'll have uh, the next. Well, there oh, she there is. There we go. Good evening, Jade. Yes. Hey, this is Big Perm with Hello? Uncensored MMA Online Radio. How are you? Good. How are you? Uh, I'm alive and kicking. I'm doing well. Uh, we're getting the show kicked off tonight. You're our first guest, and just wanted to say thank you for taking the time tonight. Uh, hopefully, we're not catching yeah, you in the middle of, of nothing. Yeah, thank you for having me. No, no, no. Well, you're Perfect welcome. timing. All right, cool. Well, listen, before we get rolling, I wanted to bring in my co-host. I got with me Dave the Butcher Clifford. Uh, Dave, are you there, bud? Absolutely. It's a great honor to have you on the show tonight. I can't wait to get a different perspective on the fights that uh, all of us love to talk about and watch. Well, Jade, are you with us still? Yeah, sorry. I think my phone somehow... Muted. I cut out with you guys. Um, I'm going to oh, go okay. to another. I'm in Colorado. I'm going to go back to another room because it gives me full bars back there. Okay. Good deal. <laughs> okay, perfect. Sorry. Uh, no worries. No worries. I mean, this is what happens when you do things live, you know. <laughs> Every now and again, you run into some small technical problems. Yeah, I'm in uh, Telluride, so it's kind of like Whoville, so they don't have that many cell phone towers. <laughs> Colorado, huh? Nice. Yeah, what are you doing um, out there? Telluride. I think the population's like 2,200. Um, there's a film festival called Mountain Film, and it's basically um, films that are all about, like, you know, world issues and um, becoming, you know, the best version of yourself that you can be. Um, I'm, I'm sure you guys know I'm really involved with um, situations in Uganda. And um, hungry children all over America, and um, the videos here, basically, they're all about that. So, um, you know, I'm always trying to educate myself on, on you know, you know what's actually going on in those areas. And um, yeah, one of the lost boys from, from uh, Congo is actually going to be here speaking and uh, doing a coffee talk with him. So, yeah, I'm super excited for the entire week. That's awesome. And as I was doing some street research. You know, I stumbled across uh, your your Facebook page, of course, and saw the link for InvisibleChildren.com. Um, and, you know, in your little about section, you you wanted to do two main things, you know, act and model and then uh, help help the needy and that that's or help those in need. And that was one of the things I wanted to ask you about, you know, your involvement um, with InvisibleChildren.com and the work in Uganda. I mean, do you make, you know, trips over there frequently? Or, I mean, how often do you head over there? Um, I've never actually gone with Invisible Children. I always go by myself, but I make sure to make it out to their offices. And, and, um, yeah, I usually go every January. I didn't go this year because Bellator's season started earlier than than usual, so I'll probably end up going at the end of the year instead. Nice. Well, so as far as getting involved with that kind of a project, is there – any sort of a personal connection that brought you to that type of work? Because it, it, it is really great that when somebody gets attention, which is not very hard for someone as beautiful as you to do, to Thank make you. good use of it, to make good use of it. I mean, what brought you to this? Is there any personal reasons behind it? Um, how did you come to this and make that decision to make this uh, your difference maker? Well, I've actually only been um – you know, in the MMA world and in modeling for three years, but I've been um, an active an activist and um, you know, goal of being a philanthropist for about nine years. So um, it came first, so that so you know, when wow. um, attention started to come or I started to get you know put in the spotlight at all, um, that was you know obviously what I wanted to put in the spotlight with me. I I, I said you know because I've always wanted to be an actress since I was a kid. Um, as a kid, I would, you know, escape into movies and become the character, and um, 
that was a way of escaping, um, you know, what was going on at home was, was um, well, if I was watching, um, you know, My Girls and I was Veda, if I was watching Hook, then I was, you know, Tinkerbell. So um, uh, the Wonder Years, I was Winnie, you know, and I really became that character, like, even when the TV turned off. So that was kind of like my little escape um, as a child, and, and it, it, I guess, planted the seeds of wanting to be an actress. So that was always there. And then um, when I, you know, was made aware of, of the situation uh, with child soldiers and, and um, how many children are, are you know, were in, are still put in the same situation, because a lot of times we're in our own bubble and we think we have it so bad, and then we realize, like, oh, my gosh, there's people, like, in my own backyard that are going through way worse. And so when I came to that realization about nine years ago, that's when I said, you know, if I ever do make it, if I ever do you know, get to be an actress, like, this is what I'm going to put in the spotlight. Um, you know, of course, you know, like every model, I've got to, you know, post pictures of selfies and things like that because that's how you get people's attention. But I try to, when I have their attention, while I have it, um, you know, bring awareness to causes or or it, not even always the causes, but just uh, to mindsets that they need to be in. Wow, that's a, that's a, I'm blown away by that. I didn't expect that. You know, that's really cool. I, I really respect uh, how you're going about things. And, and, you know, you can see by the way you carry yourself. Let's get back to, um, you know, what, what, what we do. And we've been, uh, mm-hmm. we've covered events and we've uh, gone to some post-fight press conferences here in the Midwest. And I, uh, I'm a ring announcer, so I work with the ring girls at the shows that I do a lot, you know. And one of the things that I've done from the very beginning has just been completely respectful, you know, because mm-hmm. there was the way I got my first job as a ring announcer was because they fired the guy because he was real creepy with the ring girls. <laughs> oh, really? And uh-huh. Yeah, he was real creepy. He was a strip club announcer and stuff like that, so I got, um, I got, I picked up his gig, and so one of the first things I decided was that I was going to be extra, I was going to make it a point to show them that even though all the people are whistling and they they hear weird comments and stuff like that, you know, our demographic, let's face it, our demographic is uh, people who, you know, don't necessarily act the greatest around good-looking women, you know, and not to cut on anybody. It's just a fact Mm -hmm. because I see it all the time. I see creepy McCreepsters cage side all the Uh time. And so that's what, what I'm getting to is on this big stage where, People know what your name is. You know, people know who you are. They can go look things up. And, how, of course, you divert a lot of attention towards great things. But how do you deal with that? What's it like at shows? I mean, of course there's security and things. But what is it like being an object of everyone's attention? I mean, of course you enjoy it. But is there any funny stories or any times where it gets to be a little bit scary? Um, I... Yeah, I mean, Sorry. there's uh, we Sorry. kind of bring it upon ourselves, you know. Like we're we're up on stage in these tiny outfits, you know. Like it's um it's funny because you know I hike when I go hiking outside I wear like the same size outfit because I don't want tan lines when I'm on spike. So you know, and mm-hmm. and I get the same type of attention, and you know I do it to myself. It's I can't I can't really complain like oh, those pervs or those jerks because it's like I'm putting myself in in that um you know situation um but yeah i i guess it's like funny stories is just that you know you have the, your random like super fans that you know somehow find out that you know they can't find out your room number but they somehow find out what hotel you're at and they you oh. know have things delivered to the front desk for you um or um you know like i posted a photo on instagram like a month ago um someone had emailed me his his man cave and there was a wall <laughs> covered of, of, of my photos. And then he had a, a like a 10 foot mannequin, um, you know, with like a Bellator outfit he had made. And in the email, he oh, was no. like, you know, he was like, I have been working on this for so long. It took me forever to find the right wig. And I just thought like, what it do put, people think when they go the in your house? It puts the lotion on its skin. <laughs> yeah. It puts the lotion <laughs> on its skin. And I just, I just <laughs> thought um, like, how, how do people, like, what do people think when they go in this guy's house? But, yeah, so there's, like, super fan stuff like that that's, like, half funny, half, like, I don't know what to think. But um, <laughs> as far as the attention, like, it's just WTF. something. Yeah. 
Um, but I also think, like, if, if it bothers you, like, if it pushes your buttons, you have to, whenever, I feel like whenever your button is pushed, like, you need to ask yourself, well, why is that button there? Instead of instead of getting all pissy and being a brat about it, like, well, why does it bother me? Like, if it bothers me that some guy is saying, like, nice tits, like, well, first of all, you're wearing a top that is super tight. Second of all, like, why does it bother you that that guy says that? Like, why does it frustrate you? Well, is it because you think that that's all that you are? Like, because your job is based off looks? Like, I think that there's a reason why we're bothered by things. So, um, I... Yeah, wow. so I feel like if, if something awesome. pushes my buttons, I try to I try to look deeper into it. But yeah, I I don't really get bothered by. It. I usually it's kind of just comical to me. I bet, I bet it's fun. One more fun question before I turn it back over to Perm. But um, sure. I noticed and I got to attend some weigh-ins and some post-fight press conferences, and I noticed that you guys uh, a lot of times uh, you and Mercedes uh, get to stand right next to each other, and you'll be mm-hmm. leaning over and. And saying things to each other, you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, uh-huh. and the only reason I was looking at you is because there was about eight beat up people in front of you, and so I was like, <laughs> what what are they doing back there? And I wondered, what kind of stuff do you guys say <laughs> to each other? You know, like I during, during those appearances. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not. It's not like I keep in touch with the fighters outside of the fights, but I'm I am like emotionally attached to their stories and and who I want to win, and um and then I also see you know who is good guys and bad guys you know behind you know um curtains whatever the saying is but um so yeah. I you know like when when one of the guys I really want am rooting for like loses like I'm kind of bummed at at post fight press conference and not only that like even um. You know, we have such good guys and, and um, such good backstories. Um, we, we really have, you know, a league of underdogs. And um, a lot of times at post-fight, like, I just want to, you know, hug the guys that lost and, like, pat them on the back and tell them, like, it's okay. Like, you know, you'll get another chance or something like that. Like, I'm always kind of bummed at the post-fight press conference. But we're also usually just freaking starving. And that's probably – we're probably talking <laughs> yeah. about where to get pizza. <laughs> Or PB and J's because we were just at the event for six hours, and then we've got this this post fight for an hour, and you know we know who's the talkers, you know, and and if they're there, you know, we're kind of like joking about that, but usually we're talking about where we can get food. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, goodness. Well, Jay, listen. Um, while we were talking, um, some fan questions come in, and there was one that came from uh, Charlie and Geneseo. Uh, and it came in right about when we switched topics from the from the children in Uganda to to Bellator. Um, and he asked, you know, if if there were any um, you know items that he didn't use or clothes or anything that he didn't have anymore that he might want to send to the village over there in Uganda. Is there is there anywhere he can go to get information on how to get that done? Um, yeah, I get asked that a lot as far as school supplies and toys. And, you know, the um, process of getting it over there is so um, expensive and also, like, getting it in the right hands that it's it's easier to just, um, when you know someone that's going to go, uh, you can, you know, find out through various organizations, um, just kind of sponsoring that person with a certain amount of money that when they get there, they can buy paint to paint the schools or they can buy, uh, you know, or for face paint to have a fun day with the kids or, um, yeah, or um, a lot of things what they, they need is like mosquito nets. The kids wear um, the same thing every day um, and they wash it and they, you know, try to make it look really nice. It's um, um, not normal for them to have more than two or three items of clothing, um, but what they usually need is shoes and mosquito nets because they can't go to school if they have malaria. They can't, yeah, I've sponsored kids that, breaks my heart because once I sponsor them, then I find out they don't have shoes to go to school. Um, and so then you've got, you know, it's, it's like it, you you conquer one problem to get to another. But as far as sending things, um, it's always better to just kind of get them over there um, instead of sending them over there. But um, gotcha. I think as far as donating clothes, um, I, I donate a lot of clothes just to the homeless shelters in my area. Um, I try to stay away from uh, – things like Goodwill, just because um, there's been a lot of uh, bad press and things that I've researched with that. Um, but at homeless yes. shelters, you can't go wrong. They're going straight to the homeless. Yep. I shop awesome. at Goodwill. You're not helping anybody there. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm just 
kidding though. <laughs> well, mm-hmm. I'm kidding. I buy a lot. I buy a lot. I, I have to wear suits at my job, so I buy them. And you can find really good ones at Goodwill. <laughs> um, I like Salvation but, Army a lot, um, but I volunteer at, at the. Yeah. I volunteer at the – now it's kind of a trend because of Macklemore, but I volunteer at the um, homeless shelter in Santa Monica, and, um, like, you just would be so surprised how many homeless families come in uh, for clothes. And, you know, I, I sort them – sort through the clothes and fold them and stuff, and, I mean, we can't get enough. So, um, yeah, I would recommend the, the local homeless shelter. And, and there is homeless people everywhere, and people – a lot of times everywhere. don't know, but we live here in – uh, there's 500 people in my village, um, and uh, to the town to the north of us is kind of a, a little hub town. And there's there's a group of homeless people that make it through the whole winter here, northern Michigan. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. Wow. That, and we, the, the and community does a lot to help them. Yeah, it's um, another like thing that I found shocking is that 26% of homeless people were actually just orphans that were never adopted. So, you know, you, we like I think we have this idea of, like, well, they chose that. Wow. Or, or well, that was really? a drug issue. But not always. Like, sometimes they just weren't adopted. And I, you know, being a foster child myself in, in high school, um, you know, I was in the Youth Homeless Association, and they, um, you know, gave me a grant so that I could go to college. Um, but I was in a good organization. Not not all orphans have that. And they don't all get, um, you know, pushed to go to college or, or you know, money to go to college. Um a lot of them just, you know, they graduate high school and they they don't know what to do after that, you know. So. Yeah, there's a big, you know, and you don't think about that. Um, you, you're right; it is shocking to know that, that that huge percentage of homeless people are are really the product of how just not being are operated in, 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 in yeah. whatever your region is. I mean, some places have it good, like you said. There's college grants available. I know that around here. <laughs> There's a few families that do it, and they kind of have a boarding house, and one of them's good, and one of them's mm-hmm. like mean and makes people work stuff. I remember having friends <laughs> there when I was in high school, you know. And so that's really yeah, it's it's a it's a great thing, and then charity does it again at home. And when you can spread that to the rest of the world, you know, it just brings everybody just a little bit closer, doesn't it? Yeah, that's what it's all about is remembering that we're all in this together. We all just want to be happy. You know, if and, and we forget that. We forget that the person next to us cries himself to sleep sometimes too. And that, you know, their goal is just to be happy as well, just like you. And and that's the thing about why I love to travel to other countries is because they a lot of third world countries they they haven't forgotten that. They they believe in, you know, we're all in this together. We're brothers and sisters and you know, in Uganda like I, I have to drink the, the, the bottled water. I can't drink out of the wells like they can. But when they ask you, can I have water, you can't, I mean, you, you just can't say no. Like, you, you all, you know, belong to each other and share the same. And even though, um, you know, it's like, oh, man, like, uh, when am I going to find more water, you know, that's bottled? Um, it's it's just everything there is shared. It's, it's, it's rude in Uganda to say just hi. It's a put down. It says, it's like saying you don't care about that person. It's, it's the proper thing is to say how are you and wait for the answer. And here, like, especially moving to L.A., like in Austin, no one makes eye contact without smiling. Now I've lived in L.A. for a year and a half, and it's like people not only don't make eye contact, but when you smile, it's like they it, they don't know how to take it, really, you know. So I think that's just something that we've forgotten. Like, I can't go to my neighbor and ask for a cup of sugar if if I if I need it, you know. Like, it's it's weird now. We've forgotten that we, you know, we're all in this together and, and that, you know, we're I brothers guess. and sisters that comes down to it. Yes. Society has changed quite a bit, <laughs> quite a lot. It's a half mile up the road to my closest neighbor, though. <laughs> well, you know, and we're yeah. just talking about the homeless. Yeah. I mean, here in Peoria, you know, a lot of the homeless also it ties in with mental illness. Um, you know, there's just not enough right. funding for mental illness. And we had a, a – Zeller was a mental illness facility here in, in Peoria, Illinois, where I'm at. It closed, and most all those people ended up on the street, homeless, you know, with their mental yeah. health issues and – it was, it was a, it's it's sad to see them shuffling around because it's pretty obvious, you know, that they were somebody that was just put out on University Street when the doors closed and left to their own devices. And it's tough to see that either, you know, here on our streets, but I, I can only imagine over there in Africa, you know, what it's like when they're asking you for water, you know. I mean, it's like, geez, it would break your heart. Yeah. Well, Jade, I tell you, we've got fan questions that just keep popping in here. 
Um, yeah, I, I know no, yeah. If you, I, I know that's not MMA related. <laughs> so any no, other questions I'm free mean, to answer to? <laughs> for sure. Hang on just a second. I just got to pull this one up. This one here comes from Jimmy in Rock Island, Illinois. And uh, he said, I noticed in a recent interview you did that you like at the outdoors and camping. Uh, what is one of the mm-hmm. best places that you've hiked? Uh, in L.A., I hike running all the time, but it's just like I don't even feel like I'm outdoors. I feel like I'm in a concrete jungle. Um, I I would have to say, like, I loved Enchanted Mountain in Brazil. I, I stayed there for six weeks and just meditated, but... Uh, you know, I feel like I keep bringing up Africa, but um, the best place I've ever hiked was Sippy Falls in, in Uganda. It's the third most photographed waterfall in the world. And, you know, every time I go there, I'm by myself. So, and it went, at this time, this was before iPhone. So, I mean, I didn't, it was just me, a lantern, and a book, literally. And oh, wow. I, I hiked up to the top of it, and I um, I abseiled down, which is, you know, going down a, a rope right next to the waterfall, which is like the oh. most liberating feeling in the world because this waterfall is huge and it's just crashing next to you and you're right next to it hanging by a rope on this huge, it, you, there's pictures on my Facebook, um, on this huge, you know, cliff and no one in the world knows where you're at, you know. And so um, I have sailed down and when I got down to the bottom, I, I you know, pitched tent and camped there and um, it was just so liberating and 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 i could hear a village from far off singing you know um like worship music praise music and then you know later on hyenas trying to get in my tent you know like it was just emotions all across the board but it was the most literally the most romantic night of my life and i was all by myself so um i i love nature i always say that my people always ask like what the ideal first date is and i would say kayaking and then blues dancing and you know maybe jumping off a bridge or something um but you know doing that by myself was just it was incredible especially now living in LA I mean it's just got to be so nice to get out there and then be able to get away from the chaos and something like that would just yeah. free your soul you know <laughs> yeah well I think I've got one more fan question here and it comes from uh, Becky in St. Charles Missouri uh she says uh, earlier you had mentioned uh, that, you know, you guys sometimes, you know, have emotional attachments to some of the fighters' stories. Uh, who are one or two of the guys that you've become close with, you know, to their story, and who do you, you know, maybe possibly root for? Well, I think we – the most popular one that people would recognize would be Rad Martinez. Um, you know, he uh, has, you know, given up all of his – Every, everything he, he does revolves around his father. Um, and um, I think, I don't know, I think it was on ESPN, the story, or, or Fox Sports, but he, um, you know, his I think his mother walked out when he was young, and then um, his father had some type of accident and, you know, is, is basically, um, you know, can't respond, can't do anything. And <clears throat> Rad's grandmother, you know, took care of him, and then Rad's grandmother passed, and Rad took that place. So, you know, Rad's life revolves around taking care of his father, you know, and, and he gets in some training. But, you know, that's um, someone that I I, I I just want to see that guy succeed, you know. like um, right. And um, also the way that he loves his fiance, Like, he's just so um, – and, and then there's, um, you know, Brian Baker who overcame leukemia. And, you know, then his For wife, sure. you know, uh, the situation when she was having her baby – they did the C-section and accidentally, um, you know, snipped the wrong thing, and she nearly died. And it's like, <clears throat> you know, in the midst of all that, you just want to see that guy succeed, you know. And then you can't help of course, but cheer for him and then want to see him go. Hell yeah! Right. And then a lot of our Brazilian fighters, you know, the the Pitbull brothers um, have a really you know rough story, and um, they're also just freaking so dynamic in the cage. They've had a rough past couple fights, but that's a lot of because they didn't have a fight for a while, you know, like um Patricio was out for a year and a half and then and then went into fight someone like Kurt. You know, like what do you expect, you know? But he's still such a dynamic fighter that I know that if we keep him like in the cage he's gonna he's gonna, you know, just go really far. Well it's cool that you're so Oh shit. Well anyway that's our that's our that boxing bell tells us that we have just a couple of minutes left with you. Okay. And uh I guess um, we like to ask a fun question. Normally we we get fighters on here, but we've asked other people. 
If there was tag team MMA, what two people would you put on a team, and who would you like to see them compete against? Two people put on a team? Um, no. Yeah, I think that um, it'd be really cool for um, hmm, maybe like Chandler and Curran uh, would be a cool team. Um, uh, I I think um, against Probably, I mean, I, I'm i sure other people would feel the same, but it would be cool to see them tag team against Alvarez. Um, you know, they've both, you know, fought in the past, and um, I would love to see the rematch. I know everyone else would too. Um, and, you know, there's been tons of situations with that. But I think, you know, Kern and Chandler are just freaking amazing. So I think to have them in the cage, you know, tag teaming against Alvarez would be really cool. That'd be a man. Great. Let's make that happen in the UMOR fantasy cage. <laughs> That'd be a good one. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, Jade. Well, now we have so many to hold. Now we have so many hold up numbers. <laughs> Go ahead. <You> now <laughs> we have somebody to hold up the numbers. <laughs> That's right. We'll invite Jade into the fantasy cage, and she can be our ring girl. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, Jade. With the last little bit of time that we got left with you tonight. Um, I just want to give you this opportunity to, to shout out thanks to any sponsors or any you know any websites that you might want to direct people to, um, and also how they can follow along in your career. Yeah, um, my Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook are all the Jade Bryce, um, T H E Jade Bryce, and then um, uh, I my website is being redesigned. It's going to be um, up within the next forty eight hours, and that's official Jade Bryce. And you okay. guys should really watch out for a video that Cage Potato is going to release with me this week because um, I think everyone will – I'm hoping everyone will cry laughing because I, um, I I had a hard time, like, filming it without laughing, and I, I hurt myself a few times, and you'll be able to see that. So. <laughs> Sweet. Where is that awesome. again? You kind of faded out. We want to make sure you get that out there. Oh, uh, if you'll watch out for um, – a video that Cage Potato is going to release with me this week. It's um, cool. it's just it's hilarious and uh, yeah, I I hurt myself while filming and it was it was not on purpose. So, um, yeah, watch out for that and then official Jade Bryce should be up by within the next forty eight hours. We'll be looking for that as well. And there's merch on there that um, that all the proceeds go to St. Jude. So, um, if if you're looking for a way to give back, you could get a you know a calendar or a T-shirt um with my image on it as well. Awesome. Well, Jade, for myself, uh, my co-host Dave, and of course our producer, Chris, the network, Maltzberger, we just want to say thanks to you uh, for taking the time out again tonight to talk with us, you know, and we really appreciate it and appreciate the work that you do and can't wait to uh, see you in season nine. Yes, I uh, can't wait as well. Thank you guys so much for having me on. Uh, you're quite welcome. You take care and have a great night. You too. Bye. All righty. 